Well, good afternoon, Lakewood, and welcome to another edition of Worldview Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're shifting our focus into spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines. And the reason we're doing that is because we had we have spoken throughout this time of pandemic in a, in a sequential way about the attributes of God and then subsequently how we should live in relationship to God. So we're looking at things, we looked at things like God's sovereignty, his providence, how God exercises his sovereign providence um, in love and in wisdom toward the end of his own glory and that we as the people of God relate to God in joy, in delight, in worship, but also in zeal. And that's what we talked about last week, just the the focus on zeal for God. What does it mean to be passionate about God? This week, we're completing that shift and, and starting a, com- a completely different direction, really, but still within the confines of what it means to have a Christian worldview. How should we as Christians live before God? What does it look like for us to live the Christian life? And so we're going to walk over some, uh, walk through some basics of what it means to just live the Christian life uh, with a Christian worldview. And so we're going to talk about what um, I am terming here, or what is termed usually um, by pastors and theologians everywhere as biblical spirituality. What is biblical spirituality? And we're going to talk through that in all of these different aspects today and then flesh out what spiritual disciplines look like when we're pursuing biblical spirituality. So uh, if you look in your packet there uh, on the second page, there's a a new trajectory list, uh, 12 new areas that we're going to roll into. A couple of them are together. Bible intake will take two weeks. Spiritual fruit will take two weeks, but we're going to walk through all of those together, just establishing the basics and the realities of living the Christian life together. So that's what we'll look at um, during this new section. Some resources on biblical spirituality on page three there. I would really recommend, um, all of these books are good. All of them will help you. All of them will benefit you spiritually. But uh, I would turn your attention to Michael Horton's book, Ordinary Sustainable Faith in a Radical Restless World. Incredible. He just talks about biblical spirituality as the um, intentional, slow, deliberate, daily walking with Christ, which is what biblical spirituality is. It is not seeking some kind of weird high, some kind of radical lifestyle, as much as it is a deliberate seeking to honor God every day, um, slow, ordinary Christian existence. Now, I know that's not cute and it's not... um, uh, fascinating and it won't, uh, you know, it won't sell a whole lot of books to say, well, you just should live the ordinary Christian life. And I understand that, but that's biblically what we're looking at. And so ordinary would be a really good book for you, uh, in my opinion. Now, my usual suspects are on here, obviously, Knowing God by J.I. Packer, Desiring God by John Piper, always a benefit, always helpful. But I would also direct you to Don Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. It's kind of a a standard go-to book when it comes to what spiritual disciplines are and why we should practice them. So that would be a good resource for you as well. And I I listed a couple media resources. There are some sermons you can look at, a study guide you can look at, and then a couple of articles, one by by the folks at Desiring God and another one done by Core Christianity, Adriel Sanchez. Incredible work there as well. So just good resources for you, plus seven days of devotions on biblical spirituality. Uh, from Ligonier Ministries. And so those are there for you to take advantage of if you want to walk through that. This is quite the packet. It's 23 pages long. So uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, I don't know if anybody prints those out and looks at them or not, but uh, regardless, uh, it's a it's a lot of material. And I think it's, it's helpful if you uh, so choose to take advantage of those resources. When we get into the idea of what biblical spirituality is, um, have you ever heard the phrase, I'm spiritual, just not religious? Have you ever heard that? I'm, I'm sure you've heard that. I've heard that a lot, those kinds of statements. Um, I'm spiritual, just not religious. And what do they mean? When, when someone says they're spiritual, not religious, what they mean is I don't allow any kind of external um, force or external set of rules or guidelines to uh, determine how I live in my relationship with whatever God I choose to. To live with, and so it's kind of an undefined spirituality, and that's what they're that's what they're saying there. Uh, Don Whitney, the quote that I put there on page six is helpful. He says, 
There is an unprecedented interest in spirituality in the culture as a whole. A number of books on spirituality have been at the top of the bestseller lists in the last decade. The rise of curiosity about angels, near-death experiences, psychics, etc. is further evidence. And I love this line. He says, I read a survey where even a majority of atheists consider themselves spiritual people. So, Whitney's point is that spirituality is a, a pretty plastic term. People use it interchangeably to mean all kinds of things. So should Christians use the term? Should we use that term? Spirituality? Should we use it? I think we should use it. I think we should use it because at its root, if you look at Latin and anywhere else, uh, what you know, the etymology of the word or the way the word is constructed is really talking about the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit inside the life of a believer. And so... I, I think we should use the term spirituality, but I think we should define it the way that God defines it. And that means we have to be regulated by the Bible. I know this is where I will lose some of you, um, but but I believe that Scripture is our fundamental and final authority, not our experience, not people that we think are spiritually mature outside of Scripture. The Bible is our final authority. And so we should determine what we think about following God by the book that God wrote. And so when it comes to spirituality, we are looking at biblical spirituality. And that's why I termed it that way. Uh, You may have different definitions for what you think spirituality is and what it involves and what it means. But what we are most interested in is what does God say and what does God mean when he talks about spirituality. And so... um, and I know this is a study on spiritual discipline, so this may feel like a disconnect. Why are we talking about spirituality when you're just going to be talking about prayer and Bible reading and stuff? Well, uh, spirituality is really what it looks like to follow Christ, what it looks like to follow and live for and, and live in a Godward direction. And so that, that uh, determination is made by God. If he is the one who defines all of those things, then we should figure out what he means when he says spiritual maturity, not what we think that means when we talk about spiritual maturity and what it looks like to have a Christian or biblical spirituality. And so we want to determine all those things by the Bible. And so uh, the Bible, and the, so uh, point number one there, importance and relevance, the Bible determines what spirituality is. It defines the shape and the structure of spirituality. So the what The Bible determines what is biblical spirituality. What is Christian spirituality? Well, I've always thought doesn't, no. Well, somebody told me once, no, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about spirituality? That's what defines it, not what we think or feel or, nope. What does the Bible say about biblical spirituality? What does it say about it? So that defines the what. And the Bible is also the resource for spirituality or the how. So how are we to be spiritual people? How are we to to think about and follow through on biblical spirituality? The Bible is the resource for that. And so what does the Bible say about those things? Uh, Well, a few things. Number two there on your outline. uh, Biblical spirituality is centered upon knowing the triune God. Knowing the triune God. We see that in the text of Scripture in several places, but I listed one here for you. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so Paul here is concluding a letter in 2 Corinthians, and his his prayer for them is that they will be in relationship with and know the triune God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So, it's centered upon knowing God, specifically the triune God. That's what the text is teaching us. So, there's the first point. Biblical spirituality also consists of knowing ourselves in light of Scripture. You know that great passage from Isaiah, right? Isaiah 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his faith, with face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And with and one another, one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds of the temple shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
knowing ourselves in light of Scripture means knowing ourselves in light of the way that Scripture points out who God is. That is, the testimony of Scripture about the person of God determines the way that we view ourselves as people. Or, to put it another way, we can only know ourselves truly when we know God rightly. Uh, And the place where we know God rightly is in the Bible. Nowhere else. Nowhere else is God described and displayed as he is in Scripture. And the other things that we notice in nature and other things around us and the circumstances in which God interacts... Those things are defined by the Bible, not by our experiences. That is, God has determined and defined for us how he acts in the world around us, and we can see the evidences of those things, but we don't know that that's what it is unless God has revealed himself. And luckily for us, providentially for us, God has done so in the Bible. And so uh, scripture shows who God is and it shows who we are in light of who God is. And that's why Isaiah responds the way that he does. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I am undone. Uh, I love what Mark Dever says about, uh, knowing ourselves in light of scripture here. He says that scripture is, uh, dis- displaying who we are is like throwing paint on the invisible man. That's so wonderful. That scripture reveals who we are and, our need for Christ. That's the other thing that you see that that biblical spirituality is Christ-centered. It's Christ-centered. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Um, I'm going to read this entire section. And the reason I want to read it for you is because I want to emphasize things that you might not emphasize unless you see it here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan in the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You hear all the phrases in him, in Christ, through Christ. Our salvation is in and through Christ. Biblical spirituality is Christ-centered spirituality. Also, it is gospel-centered, gospel-centered. 1 Peter 3, 18 there. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. The death of Jesus on the cross is what brings us to God. It is the, the, the good news of the person and work of Jesus Christ in the gospel that brings us to God. It's gospel centered. It is also a spirituality of the word. Biblical spirituality is a spirituality of scripture. If you take out scripture from biblical spirituality, it becomes other spirituality, some other kind of spirituality. Biblical spirituality is just that. It is biblical. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is, the authors of Scripture wrote what they wrote because God wrote it through them. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof for correction and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete or mature or perfect, equipped for every good work. So the good work of spirituality is only done through scripture. So you cannot be healthy spiritually without the word of God. Lastly here, Biblical spirituality is a corporate spirituality. What does that mean? It means that our spirituality is lived out in the fellowship with other believers. 
Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Now, this is very important that we read these verses. And the reason I have listed out every single verse is because I don't want people to just pass over these things thinking that I haven't read uh, the actual verses themselves. And I'm just throwing out cross references here, little proof texts here and there to establish my case. I want you to read every word of every verse so that you can see the truth that we're coming to is not something that I have made up or that I'm taking from someone that I think is right in different areas, but I want you to see that the things that we're doing, the things that we believe, come from the text of Scripture, that God has written these things down for us, not just some theologian that I think is smart. And so Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16 teaches, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Now, unity is often talked about. Unity is often used as a way to gloss over any distinctions. There shouldn't be any distinctions at all. But in reality, what you see here is there's unity of the faith. That means God has given us revelation about the faith, about the gospel, about the word of God. And there is to be unity over those things, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean there aren't distinctions in what those things mean because he's given us the Bible so that we can understand those things. The unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So that's what unity of the faith is, knowledge of the Son of God, the gospel, to mature manhood spiritual maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Christ likeness, so that we may no longer be children, immature, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth, that's assuming there is actual truth, the truth in love, So we do this with a particular attitude. We preach the truth, teach the truth, explain the truth because we love people enough to tell them the truth rather than to tell them it's fine. You don't need to understand what the Bible says. Just believe generic spiritual kinds of things and it'll be fine. No, there's actual truth that we believe and we love people enough to tell them the truth. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So all of Christ's work is leaning into the work of the church that as we together make progress in the faith, we help each other grow in spiritual maturity. Biblical spirituality is defined by the Bible. Biblical spirituality is defined by the Bible. And the Bible teaches sanctification. The Bible teaches that there must be growth in godliness. The Bible teaches that everyone should be striving for moving towards spiritual maturity. At the same pace? No. At the same time? No. But toward the same end? Yes. With the same means? Yes. The end is spiritual maturity, Christ's likeness, growth in maturity in the gospel. And the means is scripture as we walk together in that way. So so the Bible defines those things. Well, the Bible teaches sanctification and the Bible teaches growth in holiness. And that's what brings us to our last section here. How does sanctification, growth in holiness, relate to spiritual discipline then? And I want to cover this as quickly as possible because I know um, I'm going a little long here. So very quickly, uh, these four points here really quickly. Number one, sanctification has a definite beginning at conversion. So we begin our process of sanctification at conversion. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those in every place who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So called to be saints refers to the effectual calling of God, whereby he brings people to himself and they are sanctified, set apart. And so there is a a set-apartness of people that begins at conversion. Sanctification thus begins at conversion and it also increases throughout life. Uh, Romans 6, 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to leading, that word leading is very important, leading to more lawlessness. So now, now that you're believers, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading, there it is again, to sanctification. Or Philippians 3, Paul's famous passage. 
not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, who are grown up in their faith think this way. That is, there's always a pressing, there's always a growing, there's always a learning, there's always a need, there is always more that we can know of God, and there's always more that we can know of his word. That is always the press for the actual Christian who is growing in actual spirituality. That's what that is teaching us. Number three, sanctification is completed when Christ returns. I'm not going to read all these verses here for you because I'm running out of time, but um, we know that sanctification is finished in glorification when Christ returns for his people. So what does this mean for us when it comes to the practice of spiritual disciplines? What does it mean? A few things really quickly. Number one, we practice spiritual disciplines because we have already been sanctified in Christ. We've already been set apart. We've already been changed by the power of the gospel. Romans 8, 3 through 8 um, teaches us that here, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. And so we've been changed by the power of the gospel. So we set our minds, we, we make definite determinations about the way that we live our lives because we've been changed by the power of God, not in order to be changed, but because we have been changed. So number one, we practice spiritual disciplines because we've already been sanctified, already been set apart in Christ. Number two, we practice the spiritual disciplines because we need to grow in godliness. Uh, First Timothy four is so great here. First Timothy four have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. (sighs) Rather, train yourself for godliness. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Extremely important to see those distinctions. Training yourself for godliness. He's contrasting physical training with spiritual training. And that's what the spiritual disciplines are. Spiritual training. They're spiritual training. Not in order to earn something, but because we've earned everything, because he has done what he has done in the person and work of Jesus, God has called us to make progress in our faith. And he has given us the Holy Spirit who is pressing us on forward in our knowledge of God and his word. That is the activity of the spirit in the people of God. And so uh, Paul makes this admonition that godly training, training in godliness is, is is of value in every way. And then thirdly and lastly, we practice spiritual disciplines because of our hope of glory in Christ is certain. 1 John 3, 3, everyone who thus hopes in him, in Christ, in his return, purifies himself as he is pure, as Christ is pure. Romans 8, 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorified, so we, the end is sure. So we, we live in the way that we do, practicing spiritual discipline to make progress in biblical spirituality. So that's what this is all about. This is all about biblical spirituality and the, the practice of that in spiritual discipline. So uh, one little quote here from Brian Chapel. why this all matters. The spiritual disciplines, he says, enable us who have been made righteous by Christ to breathe more deeply of the resources that God freely and lovingly provides for the wisdom, joy, and strength of Christian living. Christian living is not easy living. And it takes discipline for us to live in a way that will aim toward God's glory and our good. And that's what this is all for. This is all for the production of uh, these spiritual disciplines. It's all for uh, the glory of God and the good of God's people. And it's all for what we've termed biblical spirituality. It's all laid out in scripture for us. And so I'm excited that we get to go in this direction. It's going to be an enjoyable journey for us all. I'm, I'm, I hope at least I'm praying in that way. Uh, but thank you for joining me on our first installment of this new direction in spiritual disciplines. And I will see you next week.